uh, to turn your Bibles over to the book of Revelation. And I, I want to uh, begin by saying that when we discuss some of what we'll discuss tonight, it may, uh, it may concern some folks. I got a uh, message uh, this week or last week, whichever it was, and uh, somebody wondered how the preacher could say such a thing. And uh, sometimes when the preachers say such a thing, if they happen to be reading it out of the book, they say such a thing because it's in the book. Um, but let me reaffirm to all of you tonight, um, and I want you to take this message to your families, to your friends, to your co-workers. Um, I know that we're living in a time of, of great uncertainty all around the world, and I know that. But no matter what comes tomorrow or what comes next week or what may come next year, whatever it is, no matter what we experience or how much of it God allows us to experience, understand that as long as your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life, you've been saved, washed in the blood of Christ, you're on your way home. No matter when the Lord decides to take us, we get to go. And so when you see and hear some of these things, don't be alarmed. Jesus said, rather, when you see some of these things, when you hear some of these things, he said to look up because your redemption draweth nigh. Now, I don't know what 2016 is going to hold, uh, but I can tell you this. We are a week closer to the Lord coming back than we was last week. Whenever it is, we are now a week closer. So if you've got your Bibles tonight, I, I want to uh, briefly read a couple of things and then we'll expound upon them a little bit. Um, I, I would begin to read in verse 9 of chapter 14 and uh, it, it speaks here. It says, The third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image Whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Now, I want to stop there. Um, and we spent a couple of weeks of, of question and answer um, explaining what the wrath of God was and why the, the Bible said it is because of disobedience, the wrath of God is going to be poured out. But here uh, it gives us a, a glimpse of the torment that the folks are going to experience that experience the wrath of God. But in the middle of that, it also gives us a glimpse of hope and it tells us that we've got a choice. Now, I say that because it talks about those that receive the mark of the beast or take it. And there is, if you want to strike up a conversation with anybody and it doesn't matter whether or not they're saved or unsaved, most of them want to talk about the mark of the beast. If you end up, if you go into a uh, restaurant, for example, 
and uh, you buy some donuts. And when you're done, your bill comes to $6.66. Most of the time, you will not make it out of there without the person behind the cash register or somebody saying something about that. Well, here's what I want you to understand. The idea for the child of God is now, tomorrow, next week, we still have, if, if you're saved, let me tell you that you have the opportunity every day of your life to choose to serve God. Now, I'm not talking about you have the opportunity every day to get saved. But when you get up in the morning, you, you will make a choice. Today, I'm going to serve God. The Apostle Paul said it this way. He said, I have to beat my body into subjection and I die daily. So what I want you to understand is when we talk about all of these things, God is not just standing up in glory or sitting up in glory, looking down with this big bowl of wrath and cannot wait to pour it out upon the earth. God is doing everything that he can to see to it that all men have an opportunity for salvation to escape the wrath of God. Now, I told you a couple of three weeks ago, I do not believe that the church will be here during the outpouring of the wrath of God. Now, if you think that we will, that's okay. I mean, you can, you're allowed to have, and let me pause here for a moment and tell you, you are allowed to have a difference of opinion than the pastor. How many of y'all have figured out that we're not always going to agree? <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Don't you all get so much... Look at that. Let's try that again. How many of you all have determined that you're, yeah, you're all not supposed to get so much pleasure out of that. It's like, hey, preacher, that's me. No, I, I'm not naive. I know that, what did you say, Jim? Here's the thing. We, we can have differences of, of opinion. Uh, we can have different theologies. But when you think about it, the one key element in all of it is that a person is saved. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus when Nicodemus said, how do I get to heaven? What I have to do? Jesus said, you need to be born again. You, you may not have the same theologies or the same ideologies. You may not interpret the scriptures the same. That's okay. But here's the thing. It is this pastor's hope that we are telling our people, our families, that they can escape the wrath of God. Because I think it's real. But I'm going to read it to you in just a few minutes out of the scriptures. Some of what God is going to allow to happen here on the earth in the last days. And when you think about these things and that there are people that are experiencing these things it'll make you really want to get out there in a hurry and keep them from experiencing these things. So when he talks about the, in verse 11, it talks about the smoke of their torment ascendeth up. How long is forever? Huh? Ben says never ending. Eternity. Uh, there you go. See now, that's a hillbilly term for me. Forever is a long time. You know, and so when it talks about here, when you look at the fact that the scripture says they don't have any rest day or night and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, we need to understand that's real. God didn't just put that in there to scare you or to scare somebody else into serving God. This is real. 
But he also gives us an understanding when he says this in verse 12. He says, this is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. What he's saying there is no matter what happens, no matter what you have to face or no matter what I have to face, and I don't know what it's going to be, but what he wants us to understand, and I've said this from the pulpit time and time and time again for simpler matters, God has got this. That's all that's saying. Simply, God is in control. There's nothing here that catches him unaware. All right. We okay with all of that? Then in that case, let's go to Revelation chapter 15. He said, And I saw another sign in verse 1, In heaven great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. If you underline anything in your Bible, you might want to underline that, that it says it's the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Verse 3, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now, I want to stop there just a second and uh, I want you to notice something about this group of people. First of all, uh, we find that it is them that got victory over the beast. They made it. They overcame him. We also find here, what is the song of Moses representative of? Anybody know? Have any idea? Now remember, I know we've been off a couple of weeks, but remember, you've got a couple of sects of people that the scripture talks about. You've got the Jews, you've got the Christians, then you've got the Gentiles, okay? The song of Moses here, the servant of God, generally is accepted to be the Jewish people. They can sing the song of Moses. The Gentiles can't sing it because they're not of Jewish descent. But there's something else here that's a little different about these people. Not only can they sing the song of Moses, but it says also they sing the song of the Lamb. Now, Cassie asked a question several weeks ago, and uh, we was talking about, well, if the, if the Jewish people understood what the book says, why is things going to happen the way that they're going to happen? Mostly it's because they don't accept what we read in the New Testament. Okay? So they are still looking for their Messiah to come. For them, Messiah has not come yet. They think Jesus was a great man. He was a great prophet. But they're still waiting on Messiah to come. And so here, at some point in all of this, the nation of Israel is going to understand because of the unfolding of the things that we're about to read who Jesus is. And at some point in all of that, they're going to accept him as Messiah. And so what you have here is you have a group of people that will overcome in the last days that I believe, according to that scripture, will be out of Jewish descent. I believe they'll be able to sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And so this is, I believe, the remnant that God talks about. Now, when we look at this, these people are, are how do I want to say this? Because we oftentimes think that if, if we are God's chosen people, or in this case, we are the bride of Christ, we are the church, that oftentimes difficulties will not come our way. The way that I read that about these people, 
difficulties came their way, they just overcame the difficulties. And the Bible teaches us that we are more than overcomers through Christ. So we, in order to overcome, though, we, we've got to sometimes there are things that are going to come our way. Now, when uh, we begin to look, this chapter starts out, we see the angels and they have the seven last plagues that are filled up with the wrath of God. Now, it gives us here a picture of them that overcame the beast. And I want to read the remainder of chapter 15 just because of what it says, what it is, before I get into the harsher part of this. He says here in verse 4, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, glorify thy name, for thou art only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. The seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, having their breasts girded with golden girdles, one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God from his power. No man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. At this point, When you look at this, God from this point until this outpouring takes place, if I read that passage of scripture correctly, is no longer approachable. We talk about God sitting on the mercy seat and surely he does. We talk about God being a loving God and surely he is. We talk about the grace of God and surely there is the grace of God. The Bible said that his mercy is renewed every day. He is an incredible God. But at this point, when these seven angels leave with the seven vials that are full of the wrath of God, and the Bible says there that the smoke in the temple was so great from the glory of God and from his power that no man was able to enter into the temple until the seven, the plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. I think we need to pause right there for a moment. And I think at this moment, the heart of God is broken. I, I, I think that at this moment, for those that are about to experience what is about to be unleashed, and God being God is aware of all of that. I, I, I know that the Bible teaches us that it's not his will that any should perish, but that all men should come to repentance. And uh, I think at this moment in time, if you pause and you look and you try to peer back into the temple and, and, and understand what is going on there, um, I, I think that at this point you find a God in heaven that has done all that he can do for all that he can do it for. And his son has been rejected for the last time. And I know that's a, a heavy picture to paint. But when I read that simple passage of scripture, that's what I see. Any questions about that before I. Everybody's clear as mud. We're OK. <laughs> yeah. All right. Then in that case, chapter 16, verse 1, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways, pour out the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. Now I want to stop there and I want to ask you all a question. What does it mean when it says here that they are to pour out their vials of, wrath, of the wrath of God upon the earth? And it's not complicated, and I'm not trying to make it that way. You just need to understand what that says, sir. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sis. 
Unleash it? Yes? Pardon me? Sure. Just, just simply, if you read that, first verse of chapter 16, when he talks about there that they are supposed to pour out those vials of wrath upon the earth, what does it mean when you read it? Not what do I think it means. What do you see? There you go. Everyone on earth? Okay, what else? It's going to get really bad. Now, y'all remember me telling you it's going to get really, really bad? And then it's going to get really, really good? Well, here's the thing. And again, understand that in, in the midst of this, we find those that God has got his hand of protection on. But I want you to see that this is real. A lot of people for a long time and still, and I don't know why, they will not read the book of the Revelation. They, they, don't, they just would rather ignore it because they feel like if they ignore it, it somehow or another is going to keep it from happening. But it's not. It says here, they were commanded to go their way and to take the vials that they had and one by one they were to pour them upon the earth. Now, when that wrath of God is poured out upon this earth, it's going to have an impact. And I think sometimes that the church neglects these passages of Scripture because, well, I think that if we realize what's about to happen, we'd, we'd probably be a little more persistent at what we do. Look at this. And I, again, I want you to underline in your minds or in your Bibles that it is upon the earth. Verse 2, the first went, he poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast upon them which worshipped his image. Want to stop right there. Interesting to me that the very first vial of the wrath of God is poured out upon those people that chose to deny God and accept the beast and the antichrist and everything that exalted itself above God, that it was God, that is the very first group of people that are chosen to be a part or to be enveloped by the wrath of God. And, you know, the thing is, and, and you look and you wonder why that is. Well, here's the thing. You got to understand when people worship the beast and his image and they embrace that ideology, basically what they are saying openly is we are rejecting the idea that there is a God in heaven who loved the earth enough and the people on it enough that he gave his son to die for them that they might be saved. So they've rejected all of that. And not only have they rejected it, but they blasphemed it. And we, by the way, see some of that today. It's all right in our country now to be about any other religion except for a Christian. If you're a Christian, well, you know, our rights are going downhill in a hurry. But the thing is, these people that made an open mockery of God and his plan of salvation... Those are the people that are chosen. And so the scripture says that when the angel poured out his vial again upon the earth, that there was a noisome and grievous sore upon men. And, and when you look at that, there are a million different ideas. Some of these things that we're going to see when we talk about these vials of wrath, uh, there, are, there are folks that believe that what's happening right here is this is a result of a nuclear war or a nuclear holocaust or some kind of smart bomb. Here's the thing. What you got to see 
is that it happens to a very select group of people. Which means it is not a natural disaster. It is not a man-made disaster. It is not anything that a couple of fellas got together and decided to do something and so it impacted a community or a country. This is happening to the people that worship the beast in a box. And so unless somebody is, you know, like really, really, really supernaturally intelligent and know who all them people are, I don't know how that anybody could do that but God. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, and, and again, I, I find it amazing that of the seven vials that the first one significantly points out that it was the people that had blasphemed God. Not just the average individual out there that had rejected religion, but the people that not only rejected it, but blasphemed God and accepted and worshiped the beast. So they embraced the Antichrist completely. I find it fascinating that the first group of people is that group of people. Verse 3, the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. It became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. Now, when we look, unless we understand the significance of the sea, we understand the significance of how it fits into our culture, into our economics. I mean, if, if we have a, uh, let's just, let me, let, let's just, this little group of people right here that's here tonight. How would your all's tomorrow be if the internet was, if it was just out? Huh? You mean, no work? No work? Yeah. Woo! Oh, no, wait, you're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. We had issues in Columbus that changed because just because something happened in New York. So, yeah, without the internet. And that is the internet. When you think about uh, the economic and the social environment that we have, um, what happens if we have an oil rig down in the Gulf of Mexico or just one oil rig? that catches on fire. Oh yeah, see now we can, we can associate with that because we feel that wrath, man, the gas prices skyrocket. I've often wondered how it is that immediately when something like that happens, gas goes up, when they get it put out and fixed, it takes forever for it to come back. I don't understand that. But my point here is we are talking about little bitty things that are in the scheme of things insignificant. And yet they impact our lives greatly. This is talking about the fact that there is going to be a vial that is going to be poured out on the sea and it's, it's going to be dead. It, everything, any kind of, I mean, you think about that and how is that going to impact the world? Now, here's the thing to understand that we also know um, that the Bible teaches us that in the end time, the world is going to wax old as a garment and she's not going to be able to sustain herself. Well, during all of this, there's going to be a lot of folks that's going to be hungry. Now they're going to be hungrier. There's going to be chaos because of that. The, the, the social and the economic impact of this is going to be absolutely beyond anything that we can imagine because we talk about things in this scope, and God is dealing with one this big. Now watch. He goes on to say in verse 4, 
the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became his blood. Now, here's why that's important. Look at what it says. It says the rivers and the fountains of waters. Here's why this is important. Because first of all, we found a moment ago that the sea become his blood, and now all of a sudden, the rivers and the fountains of waters, the same thing happens. And uh, what happens if we no longer have water? Huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess we get thirsty. But here's, here's the thing. What'd you say, Seth? Yeah, you can't, you can't go very long without water. And so what is happening here systematically, if you will look at this, God is beginning to shut off the lifelines to these people. Now, I got to tell you, can you all imagine for a moment how it must have been when Noah finished the boat and God called Noah and his family in and the Bible said, and God shut the door and the rains began and the fountains of the deep opened up. Can you all imagine for just a moment with me how the people that were on the outside of the boat must have acted, must have felt? How do you think they felt when the water got up to their knees? Yeah, when the high ground began to disappear and there was no longer a place for them and for their families and there was no way out and the rain kept coming and the water kept rising and they couldn't get out and they couldn't get out and they couldn't get out and one by one by one, the multitudes began to drown in the floods that God had sent and yet God had told them and told them and told them and told them that it was coming, but until it came, they never believed him and so those people that were not in the boat experienced that flood. The same thing here, God is beginning systematically to close off the very essence of life to these people. Now, I know when you look at this, it sounds really, really harsh, but I believe that God gave every opportunity that he could give. Uh, in verse five, I, I believe that that statement is backed up. He said, and I heard the angel of the water say, thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, which wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Now, that is, is I believe, added there because it is about this time when this is the normal question that is asked. How could a loving God do such a thing? When you look at it, when you see what is happening and yet what it is, and I said in the beginnings of this study, there are consequences. Even for us, there are consequences for our actions, consequences for our choices. If we choose to disobey God, there are consequences for our disobedience. And the scripture says here, the angel of the water said, God, you're righteous, you judged correctly because this is what they've done, so you've given them blood to drink and they are worthy of your judgments and your wrath. Verse seven, I heard another out of the altar say, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Now, before I go on, let me, let me say that the angels understand what's happening and they're, they are in complete agreement with God's judgment with the things that he is doing. But let's be fair about this. When we're reading this, isn't it hard to get our little peanut brains wrapped around what's, what's unfolding here? I mean, really? When, when we think about, I mean, I know what the book says. I know why it says it. I, I, I understand what is going on. But the thing that's hard for me to get my mind wrapped around is how did we get here to this point that it became so bad that God 
had to command the angels to pour out his wrath, and yet when he did it, it had got to a point that the angels in glory who have been looking on this thing look at God and say, the things that you are doing, they're righteous, and they're true, and these people deserve exactly what they are getting. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, I think that as these things, and again, we are talking about the supernatural, um, and because they are ever aware of the supernatural battle that has been going on since the beginning, they are aware of, of what is happening and why is it is happening. I don't necessarily know that the individual angels knew until his vial was poured out, what was going to transpire. But, but at the same time, when, when you think about what they're doing, I believe that even though as they do this and in glory they are aware of what is unfolding, it doesn't negate from their worship of God because of his majesty or his glory. So, and, and again, that's because the natural thing for us is to look at this and say, how in the world can this be happening? I mean, is this like really real? Yes, it's really real. And you have to, at that point, you have to look at it from the supernatural perspective because if we try to put our minds around it, I got to tell you what, no matter how many times I read this, it's still, it's hard for me to compute it in my mind. And the only thing I can do is go back in the scriptures to the scripture in Peter that talks about, it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all men should come to repentance. And that he is long suffering because of that. He, he has done all that he can. And, and I don't believe that any of this will happen until God has done all that he can do and preached as all that he can preach and gave every opportunity. But at this point, I do believe, sis, that the angels understand what's happening. And, but again, they have a supernatural viewpoint. They're, they're seeing the big picture. I was, te I was, go ahead. Yes. Because it's much bigger than, yeah. I, I was telling somebody this morning uh, when, when my grandkids, uh, Andrea and Caleb, love to put puzzles together. Andrea loves to put pieces where they do not go. She will get one that looks close and, and she will, she'll put it down in there and she is absolutely as proud as she can be until I would tell her, Linda would tell her, Honey, that's, it don't fit there. But Papa, she said, and look. I said, honey, it, you just, you forced it to go down in there. But when she would finally get a piece that did go in, and she finally got to the point where she could put them together. And, and you know, sometimes understanding this is like trying to put together a puzzle that you've never seen the front of the box. Okay, and I don't pretend to have all of the answers because I've not seen the front of the box either. Every now and again, I think God goes and you get a glimpse, you know, just a little one of how big it is. And it's like, God, could you hold that up a minute? Let me get a bigger, you know, bigger glimpse and see if I, but sometimes when we try to put all of this together in our minds and in our hearts, it's like doing that puzzle without ever seeing the front of the book or in front of the box. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, and I think that that's sometimes that's this. If we go on over and read the end of the book, we win. But man, putting these pieces in this puzzle is tough because of what it says. Yes, sir. What about the children? 
Well, I, he may be taught if the church if if the church is gone now here, then he may be talking about those that are, are left after that. Um, but again, um, I, I think that we have to use the same mentality then that we use now. Now, if something happens to a child before they reach the age of accountability, we believe that because of the mercy of God, that they are safe in the grace of God. Okay? And again, I think that when God's judgments are, are passed upon the earth, the people that are going to suffer through those things, it's going to be justified. When he pours out his wrath, it's going to be justified. How God is going to do, again, it's, it's like putting the pieces together without seeing the front and, and trying to get from here to the end of the book where you see the whole picture and you know that it all turns out. How God's going to do all of that, Chad, I'm not, I, I don't know. Uh, sis. Romans 5, 9. I don't know. I'm in Revelation. Okay. I don't have a problem with that, Sissy. We talked about that a couple of three weeks ago. Uh, Romans 5, 9 uh, talks about much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. And then I think uh, uh, Thessalonians 1 and 10, again, it talks about Jesus was the one who saved us from the wrath that is yet to come. And understand, again, in the beginning of this conversation tonight, this is not, I, I do not believe, first of all, that God's, the church the bride of Christ, I do not believe that we will be here to experience the wrath of God because of Romans 5, 9 and because of Thessalonians, um, because of the fact that he said, because you've kept the word of my patient, I'll keep thee from the hour of great temptation, which shall come upon them that dwell upon the face of the earth. So I, I, I think, sis, that that scripture teaches, that's why I don't believe that the church will be here during the wrath of God. But there will be somebody here to experience the wrath of God. My concern as a pastor is that I believe that we need to do all we can to make sure that the people that we know are not part of these people because these things are very real. So, and I, I, I think, uh, Sister Tammy, that that scripture in Romans is talking about the church. I don't believe it's talking about mankind. Anybody that's saved will be kept from the wrath of God. I believe. But if they're not saved, the scripture teaches me those that worship the beast, they're going to experience the wrath of God. It's going to happen. Now, the key is it don't got to happen to our people. We've got to teach them better. We've got to preach to them better. We've got to pray. And I made a comment Sunday uh, that I think that if we wrestle God for our people, we won't have near as much trouble wrestling our people for God. And, you know, that's kind of my new thing. I, I you know, I, I, I am adamant about the fact that, that these things that are going to come, they do not, we do not have to stand by and allow them to happen to our people without telling them about what's going to happen. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Well, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and, the, and the thing is, is even, and we read in, the, in Revelation again, give an opportunity, it will say 
over and over again, and they repented not, and they repented not, and they repented not, which meant they had an opportunity, but they chose rather not to. And, and that passage of scripture that she's talking about in Ezekiel, you know, it, it talks about, you know, that, that the people need to be told, and if you tell them and they choose not to accept what you tell them, their blood is required at their hands. But we must tell them. And so when, when you look at this, you know, there, there is a pause in the middle of this that says the things that God is doing in our minds, it's hard for us to wrap our minds and our heads around them. It's harder yet for us to wrap our hearts around it. So may I tell you that what you need to be able to do, and, and I, I preached a message a couple of weeks ago about the woman with the alabaster box. When she did what she did, Jesus said of her, she did what she could. And that is the clarion call of the church. When it's all done, when all of these things come to pass, we have to be settled in our hearts that we did all we could. If we did, when, when, when mom was still alive, I, I went down uh, every evening except Wednesdays. I couldn't go Wednesdays because of church. But I went down and we would watch um, Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. Every night, we would laugh and cry and, you know, mom would say, boy, you ought to be on there. You're really good. And then something would come up and I have no idea what it was. And I said, that'd be the one I'd get. And we'd laugh and then we'd cry. And when mom went home be with the Lord, um, I had a peace in my heart. Not just that mom was saved, that, but while mom was here, I did all I could. I was there every opportunity that I could be there. And, and I mean, I didn't let anything get in the way. That was our time. We spent an hour down there almost every night. And, and I look back now, and, I, I, and still to this day, I don't watch Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy because that was m me and mom's time. But I, I have a peace in my heart that I did all I could, when I could. When we see these things now, before they all transpire, we have to be able to say, as a church, we've done all we could. As an individual, we've done all we could. As a preacher, I've preached all I could. If I preach to I cannot walk, then I've got five deacons, and they'll either carry me so I can preach, or one of them will kick my carcass aside, and they'll start preaching, whichever way works. Yeah, and then April's going to sing right after Mikey preaches. Now watch. Here we find that the angels have looked at the Lord and a declaration in verse 7 is made, your judgments are true and righteous. And then he goes on, verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. Power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Now, again, I, if you look at all of these things, and, I, and I'm going to read about these others in a moment, but, but when you look at all of these things, God is making preparation for a final battle when all things will be as they should have been in the beginning when that is done. And what is happening here is all of the things that we are dependent upon. How many of y'all believe when you get up in the morning the sun's going to come up? It always does, doesn't it? Some of you all never see it, but it does come up. Yeah, there you go. But the thing is, when you look at this, the things that we are dependent upon, that we have based our life upon other than God, are the things here that are happening to change. And when you look at this, this is not a small thing. Because the, the torment, when you look at verse 9, 
it says the men were scorched. Not just burned, but scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God. Verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Again, when you look at all of this, I'll get down to the last one in a minute, but, but understand that none of these things that are happening here, they're just not abstract things that God decided this outpouring of God's wrath, there is a purpose to it as well. This is not just to make men suffer, but it, it is to make preparation for what is about to unfold. Yes, ma'am. Now, are you talking about on tw in 12? Yeah. Well, the, the difference here is in verse 12, when that happens, if you look what happens to it, it dries up. Okay? Now. Pardon me? Well, yeah, but here's the thing. In verse 4, it says they become as blood. Okay, or they became blood. In verse 12, it says that the water, which was at that point blood, it was dried up. When it became blood, it was still there. Okay, because the rivers ran red. Okay, they wasn't able to drink it anymore. But it was still there. Here, the purpose for this being dried up is so that the armies are able to cross it. Okay? So there's a difference in the significance because what's in it is actually dried up or taken away, much like he did in the beginning when they came across the sea. The Bible said the winds moved on it and it said when they came across, they came across on dry ground. This is the same thing. There will be shortly now great armies that will cross the Euphrates. Yes, because it, it and I mean, for lack of better, and it sounds gross to think about, but just because it's blood, it's still liquid. There's no, still no way across it. Here, what is happening is a passageway is being made for utter destruction. And that literally is what's about to happen. The passageway is being made. Okay. <clears throat> In, uh, I, and I'll go ahead and read 13 through 16 before we get down to 17, just so that you're aware of what is there. Uh, it said, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come up out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now, understand here that we know from when we read before that power was given to the beast to the false prophet, all of that came through Satan, okay? And this is the same thing, and basically what is happening here is there's going to be a great battle, and all of the kings of the earth, and all that have suffered through the wrath of God, 
and all that have seen what they've seen are going to gather themselves together. And uh, when that transpires, then God does an incredible something. But we're not there yet. But I, I just, that's, that's where they're headed. And we'll read more about that in a little while. Just probably won't be tonight. In verse 15, he pauses. Behold, I come as a thief in the night. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, here's just a little insert. Why in the world did the Lord put that there? Anybody have any idea why verse 15 is in the middle of all this? Because it is, by the way, in the middle because it goes right on in just a moment into the seventh angel with the other, with the other vial. But right in the middle of that, God pauses. He takes the story and puts it on hold. And he says, Behold, I come as a thief in the night. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked. Why in the world God put that in there? A reminder? No, no, you're all right. Go ahead, sis. Ah, it's a fair question. That's why I asked the question. Why, why interject it here? Sis? Okay. Okay, but the, but, but the question is, in the middle of the vials of wrath, see, because when you read down through this, it's easy just to glance over that verse and read right on down through there and not think anything about it, except I'm not that smart. I'm kind of simple. I look and I thought, God, why in the world did you put that right in the middle of that? Well, it could be if you believe that people can get saved after the rapture. But not if they take a mark of the beast. Sure. I'm confused about the wording of it, but is it like, like an told you so? That this is not right? Well, here, let me, let me help you by explaining to you when you read the book of the Revelation, here's something you've got to keep in mind. When John began to get his vision and the angel said to John, come up hither, I've got some things that I need to show you. The things that were, the things that are, and the things that shall be hereafter. Okay? When you read in the book of the Revelation, you need to understand sometimes what you're reading about is past tense. Sometimes what you're reading about is futuristic. And sometimes right in the middle of that, God will bring you back to reality and say, hey, while you're reading all this, pay attention to what I'm telling you so you don't wind up being a part of what I'm talking about. And I believe that this is an interjected thought by the Spirit of God that is exactly what Sharon was talking about. It's just a kind of, it's a warning saying, hey, in the middle of all of this, pay attention to what I'm telling you because it's going to happen. So I think verse 15 is applicable to us. I don't think the vials of wrath are applicable to us. But I think verse 15, God is telling the church, pay attention while you're studying, you know, because I believe that God put it in the book for us to read it. How many of y'all think we are supposed to read the book of Revelation? Huh? Well, when you get an opportunity to read the book of Revelation, I just want you to read verse 3 of chapter 1. It is, the Bible says, the book that blesses the reader. Yes, ma'am. Sure 
reading. Yeah. Really yeah. 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 He lifts up the box and gives you a glimpse of the picture and then he puts the lid back down. But right in the middle of all of this, he takes a minute and he pauses and he tells the church, pay attention. I, but, and, I, and I do believe because it says here, behold, I come as a thief, which means at that point, he has not come yet. Which means then, at that point, the church is still here. Now, either we're here for the wrath of God, which according to Romans and Thessalonians and a couple other places, I don't believe we can be. Now, you can believe... Well, here, when, when you read, he said, I, I will keep you from the hour of great temptation. And when you read um, this, and I'm, I'm, it's on my left-hand page, I believe in the left-hand column, but the Bible said that we are not uh, children of wrath. Okay? So, and if you go back in, in, this is the old book now, but if you go back in the, the book of Isaiah, there, and I believe it's in chapter 26, the Bible says that they go uh, into their chamber and the door is closed until the time of the indignation is passed. Okay? That word indignation is wrath. Okay? So there will be a, a time and I believe it's during the marriage supper of the Lamb that the, the church is hidden from the wrath of God. And I say it like this because it, for me it's, it's simple. And, and, and I know Y'all going to think that I am really strange. But if we are the bride of Christ, then does that mean then that God is our father-in-law? Oh, really, preacher? Yeah. Now, here's the thing. If that's the case, can you imagine living through eternity having seen your father-in-law pour out his wrath. I don't think that's going to happen. I think we're going to be in that place. God's going to shield us from that. And all of this is going to be happening here on the earth while the church is experiencing the marriage supper of the Lamb. Just what I think. Doesn't mean it's right. It's what I think. Hold on a minute. Go ahead. But the wrath of God. Yes. Yes. And, that, and, and again, there are enough places in the scripture that I believe, and we talked about those the last time that we got together when we was talking about the wrath of God and why it's coming. I, I believe there's enough places in the scripture that teach us that the church will not be here for that. How God is going to do all of that, why well, it's on the front of the box and I ain't got there yet. But I do believe that verse 15 here, God just pauses and says, pay attention. Hold on a minute. Sis, go ahead. Yes. 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 Well, and again, looking at it from, from simple terms, and I know that it's supernatural, but when I look at it from simple terms, I, I just, I, I think that in God's plan, God's plan is not for the church to experience and or see the outpouring of his wrath. And I say that because of this. Well, other than, than just the scriptures that we quoted a moment ago. If you go back into the Old Testament when it was time for the Passover and the death angel was going to come, what did he tell him? He said, you go in the house 
You close the door, and when the death angel comes, if the blood's on the doorpost, it'll pass over you. But you stay inside. What was he doing? He was shielding them from even seeing the evil that was coming. And I, I, so I just got to believe God loves us enough that he's going to make a way for that to happen. So, let me, let me, if we're okay with verse 15, just kind of being an interjected thought to get us to pay attention, because I believe that's what it is. In verse 16, it talks about gathering them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. That will be the last great battle. Uh, in verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. There were voices, thunders, lightnings. There was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts of the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a talent, men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. And the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now, when we look at the outpouring of the wrath of God, and in the next two chapters of the book of Revelation, you will find about Babylon and everything that was against God is represented there. The great religions of the world are represented there. Uh, but in this moment of time, the Bible said that God remembered Babylon and uh, you will find that the outpouring of the wrath of God there, the Bible teaches us was very, very fierce indeed. But again, in the beginning of this series, I told you that I wanted to teach you these things and we'll try to finish this up, I hope, next week. But I, I wanted to teach you these things so the church would know where to position ourselves in the day in which we live. Well, I think tonight when we think about what we've read, what we know is going to be experienced by those that are here, it is incumbent upon us to do all that we can to see to it that people are not left to experience this. Now some, no matter what we do, no matter how that we try, there are going to be some that are going to be left and some that are going to experience this, but none of them without God doing everything that he can do. And so if God has done everything that he can do, if the Lord has done everything that he can do, if the Holy Ghost has done everything that he can do, as a church, can we say anything less than that we will do all that we can do? Because that's what Jesus said of that woman. She did all she could. And so tonight, we need to do, and, and understand, church, I don't know uh, what 2016 is going to hold. I don't know uh, when the Lord is going to call the church out of here. Um, but I, I, I told somebody yesterday the things that I read in the book, they are unraveling so fast now. They're coming at us so fast that they hardly have the time to print the newspapers or put it on the news before it changes again. And when it, I, I just don't know how we can sustain it much longer before the Lord comes back. So, any questions?